And now for our weekly news segment. Tony. Hey, guys. Hey, happy weekend. Happy Saturday. What an amazing guest. Like, Yeah, Squella Bitcoin's a good, a good guy, man. I hung out down down in Argentina. From the mm-hmm. moment I met him, he was he's, he's, a, he's just a passionate, very honest individual. Uh, and that, that's why we, we did bump heads a little bit at moments just because there was some <laughs> there. And he, he doesn't hold back at all, which I love. I don't mm-hmm. hold back at all. Uh, but it's just because he he wears it all on his sleeve. He's a very honest guy. Yeah, so I definitely think if we're gonna have Monerotopia in Argentina this year, it's gonna be so special. Yeah, it's uh, gonna be it's shaping up to be to be beautiful, man. I hope you can come down. What do you think? I'm pretty sure. Yes, actually, I'm pretty sure this time I'm, I'm able to come. I have a lot more stability now, so yeah. And we, we still haven't officially announced, but yeah, it's it's happening down in Buenos. The only reason we haven't put it up yet and sh- like uh, really gotten the word out start to get the word out because we don't know exactly what dates we're going to do it because we mm. want to do it alongside la bitconf and they haven't announced their their date yet yeah but it's yep. like to be november december yep oh wow oh wow okay mm-hmm. so it's not going to be like april may it's going to be oh no 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 no, no. no we know, we always knew it was going to be november december well I was, since coming back from argentina but now we just gotta zone it zoom in on the exact uh weekend that we're gonna have it okay wow <laughs> okay yeah 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 Yeah, it's cool it's gonna be cool but i guess that's when they're gonna have their summer yeah it makes sense for a lot of reasons that's when well, that's when it's their mm-hmm. summer that's when la bitconf is happening and mm-hmm. that's that then like moves us away from the monero con conference right because their conference is in june so ours mm-hmm. would essentially be you know six months later okay so it gives us some okay. nice nice separation <laughs> that's that's really exciting yeah. um before i actually get into the next session i just want to say that um the most important thing like as well bitcoin said it's not bitcoin it's not monero but it's what they they um want to allow us to do which is to have freedom to enjoy our friends to enjoy our family to enjoy reading you know the prince the little kids and that, that's the ultimate ultimate joy these are just tools for you to to have freedom to do what you want to do in life um so that's the whole point of monero exactly now um let's get into the new section so this is very cool this is the first ever bitcoin cash to xmr atomic swap on main net oh shit. i missed yeah. that <laughs> yeah so ph citizen executes first ever main net bitcoin cash to xmr atomic swap ph citizen has performed the first ever main net bitcoin cash xmr atomic cross chain swap and is now looking to claim the 16 monero Plus 2.97 Bitcoin Cash associated bounty. So that's cool. <laughs> that's really cool. Yeah, I didn't even know. I guess I had seen mentions of it. I, I thought it was something they were working on. I didn't know it was already uh, accomplished. Yeah, it's already been accomplished. So yeah, that's a that's a night. You know, in in this day and age, it's actually uh, perhaps a more useful atomic swap than Bitcoin to Monero, given the high transaction fees of Bitcoin, um, mm-hmm. this might actually be used more as a o- way to onboard between, you know, from the centralized banking system, you could buy your Bitcoin cash and then using atomic swaps, you could anonymously move into Monero. Uh, you could do it with Bitcoin as well, but everybody knows with the high transaction fees, it's maybe mm-hmm. not as desirable. Mm-hmm. Well, this kind of brings me to this this post and then we'll go back to kick wallet one um someone under the name of gold cakes posted on the monero subreddit is there a strong investment case for monero he said first of all yes i know currency like monero does not need to be an investment i've been following monero since the crypto note days and use it both as a currency and i believe that people have a fundamental right to financial privacy however within crypto there is of course the financial investment angle and i'm having some reservations around the future outlook for monero monero's price appreciation with exchange delistings and a general sea of air that Monero is a currency, not an investment, is there an investment case for why a large amount of Monero makes sense in a portfolio? Please don't take this message the wrong way. <laughs> I love to hear pros and cons and learn new viewpoints from you all. Now, when it comes to, uh, like, for example, Binance delisting and just exchange, exchanges delisting Monero in general, that's, that's a good thing. It makes Monero stable, which as body said it's it is stable and it's been very stable actually and um the whole point of cryptocurrency is not for them to be in a centralized exchange 
those were not part of the plan. That was not Satoshi Nakamoto's plan. So Monero being delisted is actually a positive thing. And um, also, he did mention that Monero is a currency, not an investment. If you look at if you look at it through um, through the angle of it being just a currency, and you you know say you put money into it now, and then eventually it's going to become very popular. If it's going to be used as a currency by everybody, that's that's a good investment if you bought it now. Um, yeah, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, you know, it's like people. It's a tool, right? Mm -hmm. um, it does something that no other tools can do, right? It does it the best. It's the best thing out there that exists right now for purposes of digital cash. Mm -hmm. It's cheap to send. It's decentralized, censorship resistant, private. It works for that. So sure, mm -hmm. only use it when you need it. The investment case, like you said, the investment thesis is, well, if this one thing does this, does this performs this utility better than anything else, hmm. and you can speculate on the fact that as more people need a tool like this, and it and with everything that's going on in the world and the current trajectory of things, it seems likely hmm. that if you want to preserve your liberty in the digital age, if you want the ability to transact freely in the digital age, you're going to need something like Monero. So the investment thesis is, okay, uh, if that need is growing and more people are going to be using Monero for that need, then Monero is going to have to inevitably go up in price, right? It's it's Metcalf's law at that point. With the, each mm -hmm. new user, the, the value of the network goes up. Uh, Monero itself is a scarce resource. There's only so much of it to go around at a time. So the, the price of Monero and the market cap of Monero is going to have to go up to provide liquidity for people to do the things they want to do with it as, as more people use it. Exactly. And to add on to what Doug said, imagine a 1984 um, scenario by George Orwell, in which if you haven't read the book um, Gold Cakes or anybody, I highly recommend it because it's a very interesting book and it seems like that's where we're trending. Imagine that you're in, in 1984 and you're living that situation where Big Brother is watching every single move and you don't have any privacy at all. Now you have something called Monero all of a sudden, which allows you to transact anonymously in such an environment and not even Big Brother can see what you do. Is that a good enough strong in investment case? Right. I think it's really strong. It's not, not only does something very good and it differentiates itself from all the other cryptos, but it does the most important thing good, which is offering you freedom. So, right. It's like, you know, it to me, obviously, and this is why I'm, I'm here all, all the time talking about these things and spreading Monero, because I think it is, it's the most, it, it's the investment thesis that makes the most sense to me in cryptocurrency, right? Like yeah. what, what is the investment thesis for Bitcoin at this point? It's well, it's digital gold. Okay. But, but why, why is it digital? Exactly. Why, why do people need Bitcoin. Why can't they store their wealth in something else? What what gives it its base utility? And initially, that base utility came from the thought that it's the network itself, this decentralized network that allows people to transact without okay. censorship and privately. But what what we've learned is Bitcoin really doesn't provide that utility. So mm -hmm. now it's it's pivoted to just being the store of value with no longer really being able to provide the base utility that gave it that store of value in the first place. Um, so if anything, if you if you think cryptos at all make any sense, something like Monero probably has the strongest investment thesis at the end of the day, if you believe that crypto itself actually can work as as promised. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Like what's what's so special about about Bitcoin's blockchain? People make it into such a holy thing like that the Bitcoin blockchain specifically. But how is it that much different than all the other ones? Yes, 21 million and all the other stuff. But Monero is very, very unique, um, which kind of brings me to which. Let's see which one brings me to this. Actually, this um, Zeg delisting update seems like a huge positive probability delta in my book. If I were book making this event. Uh, Zcash is getting more and more likely to pass the compliance review. The only way Zcash gets deleted now is if Binance is taking a hard line stance against privacy coins. Now, I'm going to read most of this because it's interesting. Update. Last night, Naticon 
um, HenH and I had a call with Binance to discuss HenH's uh, proposed exchange address solution. The conversation primarily addressed Binance's technical questions, and in the end, they ultimately signed off on the proposal from a technical standpoint. Unfortunately, they have postponed the go-ahead for development until they completed the compliance review for all privacy coins on their platform. By the sounds of it, Binance plans to evaluate the discussions they've had with various privacy coin projects, <laughs> whether they plan to adhere to Binance's request and then potentially delay some coins based on this review. Now, if you if you compare Monero to all the other coins, who is Binance going to talk to from Monero and how is the discussion going to go? Hey, um, are you guys going to become less private? Monero, no. Hey, are you going to, no. Okay, we're going to delist you, okay. Are you sure we're going to take you off the platform? Okay, go ahead. Like, we we don't care. But I mean, here, here they they clearly say at this point, this is Zcash. At this point, we have done everything possible to operate with Binance. So I mean, that that literally defines the difference between Zcash and and Monero, right? Monero <laughs> is not doing anything to cooperate with Binance. It's not looking to, you know, it. what Monero does every day is it it designs towards being digital cash. If that happens to be in cooperation with Binance, then so be it. But yeah. in no way would Monero ever make any design decisions to try to interface with the centralized exchange uh, if it has nothing to do with improving its ability to be digital cash. Whereas Zcash is willing to uh, make design decisions based on, interfacing with fiat and the centralized systems versus making design decisions solely based on being digital cash. And we're seeing it here where they're proposing to create a new exchange address solution for purposes of being able to interface with an exchange. Um, I, I don't even know what that is. I think it's basically, it's like, right? So right now they have, they have Z addresses, they have transparent addresses. I think it's just a transparent address where you can't even then send it to a Z address. So the Z address is the private addresses. The transparent addresses are obviously the transparent ones. And currently, I guess, you know, you can send from a transparent to a private. But this new uh, exchange solution would be, um, I think, I believe, a transparent uh, address where you can then only send it to another transparent. So they're going out of their way to cater to the centralized exchanges for purposes of uh, abiding by these KYC AML bank secrecy act regulations. Exactly. Which brings me to this article, actually. Um, child abusers are getting better at using crypto to cover their tracks. Now, if, if you were someone that needed um, to cover your tracks, would you use something, would you risk using Zcash? Or would you just use Monero? And what's interesting, and we'll go over this article now, but if you look at Zcash men mentions, there's two. Monero, 19, <laughs> 10. So Monero has a spot spotlight of uh, this wired article. And essentially, for those who trade in child sexual exploitation images and videos in the darkest recesses of the internet, cryptocurrency has been both a powerful tool and a treasure, uh, treacherous one. Bitcoin, for instance, has allowed uh, denizens of that criminal underground to buy and sell their wares with no involvement from a bank or payment processor that might reveal their activities to law enforcement. But the public and surprisingly traceable transactions recorded in Bitcoin's blockchain have sometimes led financial investigators directly to pedophiles' doorsteps. Now, obviously, God forbid, this is not glorifying Monero being used for, for these horrific, terrible uh, activities. These are, that's yeah, really, really sad, but... Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's the worst possible use case for digital cash, right? It's like, but, you know, we're, we're, we're literally, we're pointing at, the, the one the the one specific way in which this tool can be used in the worst possible way it's like you could you could apply that same logic to pretty much any other widely used tool anything focus on the bad right like oh uh, a fork well you could stab somebody in the eye with the fork there's you know a hundred people a year get stabbed in the eyes by forks um if we, water. you know I mean how horrible is that you don't want to get rid of forks like it's as simple as just getting getting rid of them, and we prevent those ten people from getting stabbed in the eyes. With, with or water, you can drown someone. 
I mean, it's, it's, you know, so to, to point these things out, yeah, you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's fine to do so. Um, but you need to properly put it into perspective with all other tools. I mean, it's like the internet makes all this stuff possible. We're not here debating whether or not we should get rid of the internet, right? Because it's very clear that the internet adds more value to society than, than the harm that it causes. Um, it's very clear to me that ultimately Monero provides much more positive value to the world than the, you know, in balance, the negative use cases that it, that it can provide for. Exactly. And, um, people, you know, people that made the argument that Monero is used by criminals. So why would I use that as if they're being, you know, associated with, with the criminals, if they are safe enough and protected enough to use Monero, you should be also good for your activities as well. Because on one side of the world, people are doing these um, nefarious activities. And on, on the other side, we have um, Escolita Bitcoin teaching people about Monero and, and Bitcoin and then feeding them through his own money and doing all this stuff. So um, even like water can be used as a weapon. You can drown a person, like the dog said, forks. So it's not about the tool. Just like guns, like they won't shoot themselves. It's always the people behind, behind the tool. So it's not, it's not that, you know, Monero. But um, chain analysis Jardin says that Monero in particular seems to be gaining popularity among CSMA uh, purveyors. So, um, and then this article is is all coming from a chain analysis report that it that recently came out. Um, that basically is, is saying all these things that's quoted here in this article and and what what is what is really chain analysis like doing here what is this about um, it's about pointing out that Monero more than than anything else is being used for purposes of obfuscating transactions and essentially in a way where chain analysis can't do anything about it um, and then they're you know they're also using Bitcoin privacy tools. And they also are implicating instant exchanges. They talk about that as well. And what are they doing with the instant exchanges? They're moving from you know Bitcoin into Monero. Uh, so really, what chain analysis is doing here is is pointing out all these things that it doesn't have ability, like the greatest ability to really uh, do its 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 analysis of. Right. So mm -hmm. in, in the chain analysis world, they, they they want nothing more than essentially for Monero to to be banned from these exchanges and things. So so that they can continue to offer the services that they provide, which is chain analysis, right? So they could sell their chain analysis products for Bitcoin and all the other cryptos uh, and then get the centralized exchanges to eliminate Monero, perhaps get rid of, they will perhaps would want to see instant exchanges be removed from, from the market, made illegal. Uh, Bitcoin privacy tools, I, uh, I assume they would want to see it get rid of as well and then they could be like you know now we we have the ability to track and trace all transactions and offer these services to governments and banking authorities and That's ultimately um ultimately take off monero from exchanges go ahead because monero and exchanges is not a is not something that you should do anyway so take it off and then that's fine we can use bitcoin uh, bcash uh bitcoin cash we can use uh, ethereum and all the other coins to just atomic swap into Monero. So they would ultimately have to to delist all, you know, all cryptos from the exchanges for us mm -hmm. to not be able to get Monero. Yeah, they, they talk about unlike traditional exchanges, uh, which have largely delisted Monero, instant exchanges are non custodial and generally don't offer crypto to fiat conversions. Hmm. So they're, they're pointing out how you could still obtain Monero and swap in and out of it using these instant exchanges. But, you know, once and if they're able to uh, work with governments to make instant exchanges illegal, they're then going to have to contend with the final boss, which is <laughs> decentralized exchanges and atomic swaps. And <laughs> that's when we'll finally start to arrive at, you know, the, the final solution where it will be something that, that can't be stopped and society is just going to have to learn how to deal with it and realize that ultimately th this is good. It's a good thing. 
yes, people can do illegal, bad, heinous things with it. But just like the internet itself, you know, it's like when we moved out of uh, initially everybody that was using the internet was on America Online, right? It was a ni this nice controlled walled garden. And eventually the internet opened up in a lot of ways. I mean, you could say it hasn't in some, but um, in, a, in a lot of ways, it's become more peer to peer, people able to do things out, you know, without being in these walled gardens all the time. This is the same thing you're going to see crypto go through the same transition to the point where main streamers, not just people that are here on Monerotopia, but main streamers are going to be able to get in and out of Monero just as easily as if they do right now going on Coinbase and buying whatever Litecoin. It's going to become just as easy as seamless. And at that point, it's going to fully, fully integrate into society. And because they won't be able to stop it, they're just going to have to learn to, to live with it and deal with it and go back to doing traditional police work and allowing people to transact freely using these free speech protocols. 110%. And then uh, talking about buying Monero, actually, let's go into this now. Uh, the special promotion from Cake Wallet, 0% fees on Monero purchases. So they're thrilled to announce their partnership with uh, OnRam DFX to bring you an amazing offer by Monero with 0% fees, which is going to be available until January 19th. So 0% uh, buying fees, that's right. You pay absolutely nothing in fees when you buy Monero. So if you're interested, look on Cake Wallet and um, go ahead and buy some Monero. Unfortunately, DFX is only for certain European customers, non-US, so. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this would not be, uh, yeah, in the US, no KYC, buying Monero would not be, mm. no, no one's going to do that. Okay. Is it in all Sorry. European countries or? Um, I'm not sure which ones exactly, but it's a lot of European countries. Okay. Okay. It uses SEPA for the transfers, for the bank transfers. Okay. Watch Romania be the only not. You said it's not, it's non KYC. Yeah, it's non KYC. You have to use a bank account for transfers, but it's non KYC, so they don't have an actual KYC process. Um, so they don't right. make you KYC take a picture by, of your KYC by your bank that's then integrating with the exchange, right? It's what. I mean, you're you're you're. It's these are in situations where people are their bank accounts are connected to this exchange, right? Yeah, it's yeah, but it's still technically not KYC because KYC is a bank process where they have to process like a picture of your ID with your face and all this stuff. You're using your bank account, so it's not completely private. There's not going to be any completely private way to buy Monero on these services, but there's no KYC, so you can immediately create an account, immediately start buying. You don't got to wait two weeks or any of that crap. And they have a you know zero percent fee right now, which is cool. But unfortunately, sorry, U.S. customers, it's not for us. So wait, but how? So how are they getting away with this in Europe? Because my I like I, I thought the KYC rules were just stringent. Up to hundred euro, up to a thousand euro, and then if you want to, if you want to buy more uh, than a thousand euro at a time, or I don't know exactly what the limit is there. If that's per day or if that's total, uh, then they have to do KYC. Okay. okay. Yep. Beautiful though. Yeah, I mean, here in the U.S., the closest thing we have to that is Kraken, right? And obviously, Kraken itself has to is KYC, but uh, it's the closest thing we have in terms of being able to purchase Monero instantly with your bank account. Okay, uh, moving on. So, someone posted, "Hey, uh, Javier Millet, why on earth are you going to participate in the annual WEF meeting next week?" Um, just interesting. Yeah, I don't know if we have any of our Argentinian contingent on. If you guys want to jump on during viewers on stage, we'd love to hear people's thoughts on on this. Uh, Malay seems to be living up to everything he said in his campaign. He's he's taking actions. He's he's walking the walk as a as a libertarian. Um, but then he's also doing bizarre things like this. But maybe it's as simple as him showing up to to speak his mind in in a libertarian preserving way uh I guess we'll, we'll see what he does there what kind of speech he gives that will really determine it i don't think there's anything wrong with going to the world economic forum if you're showing up as an ancap uh and a libertarian and you're you're speaking your mind uh if you're going there and you're drinking their kool-aid and you're spreading their uh 
<laughs> things they're trying to spread, then sure. But if you're going there to debate them and to make uh, arguments to the other side, uh, nothing wrong with that. So I guess we'll, we'll see what it's all about. But he's already being like chastised as though he's like, you know, connected to the World Economic Forum because he's, mm. he's up. right, right. Maybe yeah, maybe he's just going to the conference just to speak his own mind and his own words and just to look at what other people are saying. So not as not necessarily that he's part of the agenda. Um, actually, what happens if I type in oh yeah, showing up on the WF website? He is. Mm. What is a speaker? Uh, I'm not sure. No, I'm not sure if um, I'm not sure if this means that he's part of the WEF or if that's just his speaker. Um, I don't know. This, is this whole thing, right? Like you had like the VEC, right? Was on on the World Economic Forum as, as mm -hmm. you know, like, I don't know. I don't think you can really uh, chastise these people for being on the on this website. It doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily mean that they agree with the agenda of the world economic forum mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, just, I just see too much of that right like it's like the it's like cancel culture right um yep, yep. it goes both ways right yeah like obviously uh, we we would hope that he doesn't agree with that agenda but like let's let the guy like prove himself um don't you know we, we gotta help your own here right he may yes let's be vigilant maybe he's not really who he, he says he is, but at the same time, don't be so quick to, to you know, slaughter the guy. Exactly, exactly. Uh, now let's look at this picture. So somebody said, WTF, why is my LG washing machine using 3.6 gigabytes of data per day, which is a lot. And then someone said, someone mining Monero on bro's washing machine, um, <laughs> which is funny. It's not that far-fetched. No, it's not that far fetched. I think um, uh, I don't think it uses. I don't. I don't remember exactly how much data uses my Monero, but I don't know if it's that much. Um, no, but using using devices, right? To, like hacking devices and and using them to to mine Monero, right? I mean, um, that's definitely not not far fetched. Or alternatively, it just has a has a microphone and webcam that's just constantly just sending that information to LG, <laughs> yeah. watching you do your laundry. But I do think there's a future there, right? Where where kind of these devices start to get get hacked and their computing power, like if their compute power is going to be used for something, mm -hmm. uh, Monero, mining Monero is a very likely candidate, right? Like how else can people most profit from stealing compute power right now? That will be interesting if someone hacked into a whole community's washing machine and he'll just <laughs> he'll smile on there. <laughs> That'll be funny. I keep putting this guy's yeah, this guy battle uh declared. Yeah, I think it's, he's really asking you, um, Tony, what's yeah. the what's the Monero scene in like Romania? Oh, really? oh let me go in the comment section. Give me one second. Screen, yeah, thinking of moving to an Orthodox Christian country like Romania, Hungary or Greece. Do people uh, freely to purchase goods in those countries? I have to imagine it's not that prevalent, but are you seeing any semblance of it? It's not that pe people are very much aware of crypto, especially since uh, Elrond is actually from my hometown, Sibiu. So people are very much aware of, of crypto and they invest in crypto and it's very popular. Monero, not everybody knows about Monero. It's definitely not a, you know really accepted to purchase goods. And it's going to be so. There's a lot of there's a lot of um, free markets. People selling their goods and services, you know, on the side of their house, like in the villages, or even even in the city. Um, usually, they go in certain places, and then um, they just sell their vegetables and breads and stuff like that. But it's usually older people, not so much young people. So you can try to ask them to you know to pay you in Monero for what you buy the tomatoes and everything. But usually, it's older people. And that's more difficult to get them to hop on. And then, yeah, I mean, it's going to be difficult and you know to do it in stores unless you you use Monero um, to buy a um, uh, debit card or credit card to use or something like that or gift cards. But uh, if you're thinking about moving to an Orthodox con uh, Christian country like uh, Romania, I do. What I really love about Eastern Europe is that the mentality is very different than the West because we've been for communism and we've been for a lot as a country and as a society 
were not so much um were not so prevalent to to propaganda for example romania is one of the uh, we used to make uh, to be made fun of because we have the lowest vaccination rate like one of the lowest vaccination rate because everybody doesn't trust the government and um yeah it's, it's a very interesting country where you know, who you know is more important than who you know and money is very very important and laws don't really don't really apply <laughs> so right. it's a good place to raise a family i think it's a very good place to raise a family for kids and their development and yeah good good, good food right you don't have to worry so much food. about what you what you eat there like chances are it's going to be coming from from a decent source uh yes. there's a yes. lot of positives about you know europe and eastern europe for sure um i go to i used to go to poland quite a bit oh really oh they drink a lot oh my god oh they do they, they drink a lot but they, they eat very well right it's all <laughs> yeah. like, uh i mean you know obviously that they don't all eat well but like chances are you're, you're gonna get some 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 good food there from good sources good trusted sources uh not not as bad as the american system no not at all for example when i was there i would, I would sometimes well not sometimes but all the time i would feel bad when i would get pastries but then mm -hmm. you would they would have labels with the ingredients flour eggs water you know and then whatever uh, mm -hmm. but i'll feel bad because i'm eating flour and eating this and my diet and blah blah but it's like when when I came back to the United States, and then I started looking at the ingredient list for some stuff, phosphoric acid and this and that, and the, the ingredient lists are as long as the First Amendment. Right. First, you know. Yeah, so, um, Europe is a lot better in that ways, and also, I mean, Eastern Europe, Poland. Uh, I don't, I don't know if Romania is the same way, but yeah, it's it's very yeah very conducive to to like starting a family having a family there yes buying, buying a piece of property like you can enter into the market it's not untouchable like like in many cities in in new york where mm -hmm. or in the u.s where it's just property values are out of whack with regards to how much you know the entry level uh, family is making um it's kind of easier to it's kind of like more of the american dream right now than than Amer you know than what america currently is yes i think it's a, you know if, if you can make good money it's a good place to live in especially it's interesting if you ask even the people that don't have a lot of money everybody owns at least one apartment most of my most of my friends and their families they own one to two properties but at least one uh renting is not that common i mean they do rent but owning stuff is very common and then people because family is such an important thing then it kind of guides your morals as well because you know your family's gonna ask who are you hanging out with who is that person what are you doing why are you not doing anything with yourself you know all the all this stuff so um it's a really good place to raise a family and stuff awesome man uh battle saying malay is a fraud for sure how can people see it right from the meeting yeah i don't know man i don't know if i if i'm ready to conclude that um maybe you have more information than, than we do you're welcome to jump up by the uh, by the way uh for viewers on stage give us your full take on malay mm -hmm. yeah please go ahead I guess yeah. I think oh, no. can you switch it to um the viewers on stage if uh you need to do that before i get back tony oh you want me to do that sure oh uh, yeah if you if i'm not back yet thank you oh yeah yeah sure sure i think body had something to say about the malay thing also so i added him up oh yeah please go ahead yeah, yeah so uh, i just wanted to make a small plug here um Gonna have a debate with somebody, uh, one of the Mexico anarchist people um, living in the local area. By local area, I mean Mexico. Um, tomorrow at 5 p.m., we're gonna have a debate on whether or not Mile is, uh, you know, whether he's a deep state stooge, whether he's a genuine anarchist, or maybe oh, wow. a useful idiot. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna try and hash this out. Um, he's. I'm gonna take the side that's not necessarily. It's like half pro Mile. It's like optimistic Mile. Um, I don't see any good evidence of people being like the only things people can say is like oh he took some photos with people i don't like and uh he's on the weft page like where's the real evidence who has he really harmed and yeah. so i'm going to kind of take the the position that like you don't have the proper reasonably good evidence to say that this dude is like some terrible guy and totally fake or whatever um and the other guy is going to try and take the position that um you know that malay is just uh, a patsy or or a, a psyop so we're gonna try and hash that out tomorrow. If you guys want to join, it'll be on Twitter Spaces, 5 p.m. Central. Oh, beautiful! Oh, cool. yeah, awesome. Man. We'll get the word out. I'd love, love to try to listen in for sure. That's awesome.
That's really yeah, cool. I, I tweeted it out just this morning, right before the show. So yeah, in, in my mind, I would I would agree with you, right? Like uh, maybe maybe this other guy has some convincing evidence, but like I, I haven't seen anything convincing as to why we should you know consider him a fraud uh he's i mean he's already been taking actions right he's he's already done some extreme extreme measures there in terms of cutting government spending right yeah yeah that's my thing like nobody that i can think of no single politician ron paul included has done as much as this guy to actually axe the government um now ron paul did a lot more in the social sense of spreading the ideas but malay is starting to creep up there like Millet has probably done more for spreading the ideas of anarchy and freedom uh, out of, I mean, he's got to be among the top 10 at the moment, at, at least at least for the last year, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll try and hash a lot of that out here and try and bring those arguments. So Yeah, I've never seen a world leader act like that, like actually, <laughs> you know, live up to, to, to what he said in those, in those extreme terms. Um, and I think it's having an a effect outside of Argentina. I feel like, you know, Vivek uh, is even talking differently. I think he, he's always been, quote unquote, base, right? Um, I've always been interested in what Vivek mm-hmm. is saying. But it, I've noticed I'm, I'm more interested in, than ever in him. Uh, I'm almost ready to go full full on Vivek pr- um, and say, you know, he, he's, he's my 100% pick. Because he's sounding more and more like Malay. I don't know. Have you been following that, buddy? I don't really follow Vivek too much. Um, I like most of the things that he says. I don't like that he's a big border kind of person. Um, mostly, I don't trust the way that he says it, <laughs> to be honest. And the only I- reason that I ever supported Malay at all was because he is a self-avowed anarchist. Like My favorite quote from the dude is that when the government calls you a taxpayer, that's like a rapist calling his victim girlfriend. And uh, like he completely disavows the the legitimacy and the authority of the government, which is the only reason why I would entertain him as a politician, because he says, listen, I don't believe in the government. I think it doesn't have the authority. I'm just going here to dismantle as much of it as I can. Um, And to me, like, that's the only reason I could support him, because I don't believe in these systems. I don't I don't believe that voting in uh, a tyranny light candidate is going to get us into a good spot. Um, I feel like we basically have to acknowledge the government is a criminal organization and we need to dismantle it. And so that's kind of like, that's my only, that's why I support Malay is because he explicitly says that um, in a lot of ways, I don't think it's good to support candidates. Um, and I know this is a little bit of a pushback against your position. So I, I, I still respect your position, um, but I do think it's, it's overall harmful to vote in people that are going to go in and say, well, let's reduce the government, but we'll still have a little bit of tyranny that's necessary for society. So um, that's, that's kind of like my position there. I don't necessarily agree with you there. I just, ha- I haven't, you know, i um... My thing is like working with what we got, right? Um, I just the gov- the government is is here, right? So if you can try to use the means we have to change it, uh, rather than like opting out, right? Do that as as much as I can. But the reality is, like I still live in the U.S. I still have to deal with with my government. It's there. Why not try to put people in office that can move it? towards this ideal right as opposed to completely ignoring it and saying you know what everybody's corrupt government's corrupt no matter how, who you put in there is going to become corrupted i figure might as well try to throw the best people we have who we'll usually end up being a disappointment but um, yeah, i mean there's there's a lot of practical reality to that argument and it does make a lot of sense like i, I understand the argument for sure and um and I, I would want to acknowledge the practical reality of a lot of that. Like there is this big machine. It is going to do shit to you. Um, so, and, and even like Sanders Spooner talked about like the, the conundrum that people find themselves in with a powerful government like this, they say, well, you know, even if I don't want it to be there, um, I, if I can, but just take control of it, I, I might be able to uh, lighten my chains some. So, I mean, I understand like that's, it's, it's not an unreasonable position. I just think in a, in the full analysis, generally speaking, it's harmful to lend legitimacy to the system. Um, but you know, um, we can, if you show up, maybe we can talk about that a little bit more. I don't want to, yeah. I don't yeah. want to monopolize the show here today on this one topic. So no, it's all, it's all good. Um, and we can talk about it more once we do viewers on stage. If anybody else has opinions there, I actually, I want to hear people's, uh, Vivek take. I don't know if people are following Vivek closely. I want to get the, the viewpoints of some, some Monero people out there, see what they're thinking. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's move on. Um, so we have a couple more 
articles and then we're going to go into the bitcoin um etf and then we have quite a couple of videos to show all right, we gotta let go all right keep keep it moving keep it moving yeah <laughs> but by the way i think i should play this whole video since it's two minutes and it's interesting then this whole video and then the first two minutes are interesting of this one all right so go ahead. All right, now let's talk about Thai digital money giveaway <laughs> in question after report to government. So accounts differ about an unpublished government report on a plan to use digital bot to stimulate the economy. Essentially, they want to give out $286 uh, dollars to uh, Thai citizens as an ec economic um, stimulus. This is not, um, and this, is, this will be for all citizens over 16. It's actually not a, uh, where is it? It's actually not a central bank digital currency. Um, they launched their own CBDC sandbox in June and the project lasted for three months and the Bank of Thailand has stated that it has no plans to launch a CBDC, um, which is interesting. But um, yeah, so now right now they're talking about um, giving away uh, to people as a stimulus $286 via um, this digital bat okay. uh, that they've made. So, so that's interesting. Then uh, Venezuela's unlucky Petro coin to shut down January 15th after six years. Uh, the crypto intent as a blow. Okay. Yeah, this one is interesting. Um, uh, so it wasn't then intended as a blow against US sanctions, was never accepted at home <laughs> or abroad and was crippled by scandal. The Venezuelan national cryptocurrency, the Petro, which it's also not a CBDC, will cease to operate on January 15th, basically because nobody was using it and the coin was created in 2018 to help the country evade united states sanctions but was never widely used uh, the state-run oil-backed crypto was launched after the country's fiat currency the Bol bolivar declined sharply under pressure from the united states sanctions and after bitcoin had already gained a firm foothold in the country um it was never made a legal tender meaning its accept acceptance was not mandatory and what is interesting is that not even the the banco de venezuela the largest bank in the country would accept the petro without a presidential order forcing it to do so um so nobody was using it and um except ramirez camacho he used it for uh, narcotics trading and um, he was arrested in venezuela in march 2023 on accusations of financial improperties within the national oil industry and the agency he had it was closed for the organization. Uh, the Petro was not a CBDC. Again, the Central Bank of Venezuela announced plans to create a CBDC in 2021, but those plans never came to fruition. That's interesting. It's been it's been quite some time um, for them. But yeah, that's the situation with the Petro coin. Wow. Yeah, I remember when that first came out. So that that's <laughs> I think yeah. it's a disaster from day one. <laughs> it's funny. Like not even the bank would use it unless they, they would be forced to by the government. Um, yeah, so that was that. And then, so let's talk about uh, Bitcoin and Wall Street. This is um, very interesting, uh, interesting post by Dr. Ginger, Ginger Walls. Um, essentially, he's saying that now that Bitcoin is plummeting, this is a great time to review exactly how much Wall Street has fucked the Bitcoin diamond handers um and then he talks about uh, wall street and counterfeiting and given this level of potential to counterfeit if a few big players on wall street decide to take a massive short position in excess of daily average volume it can easily cut the price in half or more this is for bitcoin again and just operating the etfs could drive the price of bitcoin below ten thousand simply yeah, because there are now more Bitcoin. Body, are, you, are you still there i want to get bodies quick insight on this the, the, they're basically this guy's alleging that the etf is going to allow essentially big players to short the market more easily. I don't know if body has uh, any opinion there. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, we've seen them set up a whole system with gold where it's not just the ETF, but the COMEX is involved in the LIBOR and all that stuff. They're all involved. Um, we have seen them set up systems by which they can short, uh, they can short gold, they can suppress its price temporarily. Um, in the case of Bitcoin, <laughs> I honestly, it's, it's difficult for me to say that they have any interest in doing that because Bitcoin isn't usable money. Like, okay, for some small amount of people on chain can do something, but anytime people actually try and adopt it and use it, it's not usable money. So it doesn't exactly promote freedom 
in a whole lot of ways. And the freedom that it does support is fairly controlled. So why would they want to short Bitcoin? It's one of those assets like they want you entertained. They would rather you be in Bitcoin. They would rather you spend your time um, hodling and hoping for mad gains. Um, and then, OK, sure, they'll probably try and control the price. Yeah. But I mean, the, the holders of Bitcoin are so centralized already. The price is already so propped up. It's like I just I don't. Well, yes, I think it's possible that this could be the ETF could be a piece of the ability to short and suppress the Bitcoin market. I don't think that's what they're going to do with it. Tony, you want to uh, show one of these videos? Tony? Oh. What are you there? Yeah, sorry, I had to. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, no, my uh, my squash was burning in the oven. Sorry. Your squash. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I put some squash before the show and I left it for like 15 minutes and I had to get it out now. So, nice. Bro, delicious. that's hilarious. Phrases I never thought I'd hear on Monerotopia. <laughs> well, I was listening to what you were saying, but uh, <laughs> so I was paying attention to that too. No, no, I, I don't. I don't mind. I don't matter. <laughs> the squash is awesome, man. <laughs> well, well, no, I got you. It's butternut squash. All right. Or you just you're just roasting it, and I just put it in the oven. I put some oil, um, spices, and then that's it. <laughs> nice, man. Nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we got the statement of approval, of the spot exchange. Yeah, we don't. We don't need to go through a Gary Gensler's whole statement. If you want to play one, uh, maybe the next video. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, um, let's play. Let's play this one because this one is with Gary, and then let's play. We're gonna play this one after. Yeah, with, yeah, both, um, both. Okay. Yep. You need sound. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. I'm going to do this. What do you have to do to play the sound? Why isn't it just play when you... Uh... To show audio or tabs? Show tab screen. Uh, okay. Well, I guess I need to... Sh also share the... Oh, okay. Well, I can... I would have to share the entire screen or that in individual... I'll just share the entire screen. That's fine. There we go. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. I'll make a test now. Joining us right now, first on CNBC. Is it good? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Okay following that uh, decision that some have described as historic is SEC Chair Gary Gensler. Uh, Chair Gensler, we appreciate you being with us. L let me start by asking you this. Do you consider the decision uh, historic? And it appears that it's a decision that you made um, either reluctantly or perhaps even begrudgingly. Well, look, uh, Andrew, uh, th this has been considered for a long time, as you know, uh, uh, starting under Chair uh, Clayton, we had uh, disapproved a number of these over the years and something had changed. Uh, I'm a deep believer in the rule of law and a respect for the courts and taking uh, a new court decision into consideration. Uh, we move forward. I think this is the most sustainable path forward. So it appears, though, from what you're saying and, and reading through the, the decision as well, that what changed is not necessarily something inherent to crypto or Bitcoin per se, but what changed was what the courts did. Is that the way to think about this? Well, I, I, again, I mean, we do everything here at the Securities and Exchange Commission within the law and within how the courts interpret those laws. And uh, that's what the American people expect. And that's what uh, we do here. What is your message to investors about Bitcoin now? Because we're going to have all sorts of public investors now potentially have access to Bitcoin in a way that they didn't before. We were just talking uh, to Larry Fink. Uh, he said that uh, he got a, a huge wave of uh, new investors uh, getting into Bitcoin through this ETF. Uh, you have still uh, suggested to be cautious uh, about it. And I, I'm trying to understand how you think about those cross currents in terms of the message you're telling investors. Well, look, uh, Bitcoin itself, we did not approve we do not endorse. This is a product called an exchange traded product, a way uh, that investors can invest in that underlying 
non-security commodity called Bitcoin. But yes, investors, I think, should be uh, aware that this, the underlying asset, is a highly speculative, volatile asset. And uh, amongst its uh, use cases is really uh, for illicit activity, money laundering and sanctions and ransomware and the like. And uh, I I've, know that you've asked other people over the last few days, um, is it being used as a s store of value? It's a speculative, volatile store of value. Is it being used as a payment anywhere? Are we buying cups of coffee with it? Not really. Uh, the only payment mechanism it's being used for uh, in, in sort of an, in a primary sense is illicit activity. So I think you've been spot on about that, Andrew. Yeah. Okay. And now let's watch um, Scaramucci. But this this is a response to um, more to Senator Warren. Yeah, you know, so Gary Gens is very much on the side of big Bitcoin. Uh, doesn't really have any utility, mm -hmm. um, and that its only use case is for doing illegal illegal things, <laughs> which is really. Referring to Monero at that at that point, more so, <laughs> and still, but it's so it's just ignorant at that point. Um, okay, so let's play let's play this video as well. Senator Elizabeth Warren and I don't think I have the tweet in front of me, so I'm not I'm not going to quote it because I don't have it. I'm just going to summarize it. Came out and basically criticized the SEC for this. I mean, there we go. Oh, great work, guys. I'll, I'll read this to you if you missed it. The, the SEC is wrong on the law and wrong on the policy with respect to the Bitcoin ETF decision. If the SEC is going to let crypto burrow even deeper into our financial system, then it's more urgent than ever that crypto follow basic anti-money laundering rules. So that's actually not from tonight, or I think it was. Maybe earlier today. Yeah, what's your, what's, what's your tonight? take on it? What's your take on that? Well, I mean, she feels like she's now bought and paid for by the uh, National Banking Association. So maybe they wrote that tweet for I don't know. But here's what I really think about her. Uh, she knows better. She was a Harvard Law School professor. She understands the law. She understands the legal precedents. She understands the administrative law, uh, but she doesn't like the law. And so that's why she's saying that. And this is the wonderful thing about our country. We have a decentralized government, a very flat system, lots of checks and balances. These two autocratic type of people, Gensler and Warren, tried to block something that was in place and tried to block something that the public wanted. You may remember the Uber situation. The regulators did not want Uber. Uh, but the people wanted Uber and the people went out in a democracy. And so these two guys, uh, they will go on the ash heap of regulatory history eventually, thank God. Uh, and this industry is here to stay. It will flourish and grow. And as Kathy said, uh, this is a layer. and These are protocols that we're going to be using to de-layer financial services, make it cheaper mm -hmm. and really help the underbanked out there that Elizabeth Warren is supposedly for but she's obviously not anymore. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. S Senator Warren's take on all this never made any sense to me. Like why she would be against crypto from day one when her whole shtick was to, you know, uh, make, make the banking sector more permissionless and accessible to people. Mm -hmm. Here she is uh, being the largest enemy of, of Bitcoin and crypto in general. Uh, I think the the most interesting is what Scaramucci is saying is right, right? Like, look look at Uber, look at Airbnb. These things yes. were illegal in many ways, but they succeeded because the market just demanded it so much. The market wanted it so much because it provided so much value. Um, that's what we're going to see with Monero, guys. If en enough people use it, that demand is there. That demand is always going to be there, especially as as the world becomes more and more digital and locked down in different ways, there's going to be always be that innate demand for digital cash. And because of that, it's in the long run going to succeed because the people are going to want it and going to demand it. Mm -hmm. hmm. It was interesting that they were against um, against Uber. And then there were some talks about that in Romania as well, where they were trying to ban it. And I think they did at some point. But Uber, I mean, Uber and Bolt and all these um, all these companies, 
they also protect the, the the consumer because you can check who's driving you and you can see reviews and stuff like that. When you go in a taxi, you just you don't know. So yeah, I mean the market is going to decide eventually, um, and hopefully it's going to be in the favor of of Monero. But it, it, this kind of brings me to what Body said the last episode that um, I think you said Body that you hope that Biden will be yeah, president again that they will do all these crazy stuff because only then people would would wake up. I think you said something along those lines. Um, if not, you can you can confirm. Um, w- but I, I would agree to that in in a way. It would you know, you know it would suck to have him as a president again and see all these crazy things being enacted. But humanity needs something bad enough to wake up because if it's not bad enough, then they're not going to um, to wake up eventually. So.